What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. Dead Meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James, and we're married, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, if you haven't had enough of me lately, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, the American Psycho Kill Count is out. Came out last week. It's yeah. pretty damn good. Oh, yeah, it would be last week now. Last week now, and then next week is the American Psycho 2 Kill Count. Yeah, American Psycho 2. It's not a good movie. It's a real, <laughs> it's a real bad fucking movie. It's, it's like, it's impressively bad. The mu- You'll see. You'll hear all about it. In the meantime, we're going to talk about a movie that is very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, X just yes. came out earlier this year. We saw it in theaters. And then we rewatched it this morning. A lot of people wanted us to review this one. Usually, if we're reviewing something, I want to have a notebook with me. And we went and saw this in theaters. And I was like, you know what? I just want to go see a movie. I don't want to bring my notebook. Sometimes we just want to see a movie and not take notes. Then, it's pretty cool. oops, we both loved it and thought, well, we're going to end up reviewing it someday on the podcast. And everyone was requesting it. So luckily, and it was on streaming. Exactly. Yep. So we were able to watch it. Uh, pro tip, if you're going to watch this at home... Watch it at night or in like a pitch black room because this movie's really dark. It is so underexposed. In the theater, it was fine. Yeah, I didn't have that thought in the theater, but then I read comments online saying it was dark. And then when we watched it it this morning, it was like Game of Thrones season, what which was at the last season where it was like you can't see anything. Yeah, Yeah. it's like that. So Mm -hmm. just a fair warning. I fucking love this movie. Yes. Even more a second time. It I, is I, in the running, I'd say, for best horror movie of the year so far. Yeah. Um, might be a hard one to beat. And I know that a lot of people heard that going into see seeing it. And then they saw it and they were like, I don't get it. Why, why is everyone? And it, it's our job today to convince you that, yes, the hype is worth it. Because literally, we had it hyped before seeing it. Ty West is a horror indie darling. Mm-hmm. He's He had previously made... Um, House, House of the, the Devil, Devil and The Innkeepers. And then he he had a small role in Your Next uh, yeah. with his, like, buddies in that indie horror scene. Uh, he's the guy with the, the scarf who gets killed right away. And so I knew of him. I had seen his previous two films, kind of. I had him on the background in while In Your cleaning. Next, isn't he, also, isn't he playing, like, a filmmaker in that? I can't he's, remember. He's, like, an artsy guy. He's kind of an artsy guy. type. I don't know if he's a filmmaker, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, yeah, he's definitely, like, an artsy guy. And so this film was hyped before it came out. Yeah, I think expectations were really high. The and it was a great trailer, too. Yeah. And so we went and saw it. And I remember in the theater, even as the movie ended, I felt like, oh, that was it. Like, it was good. But then this is one of those movies where the more you talk about it, the more you think about it, the more you realize the intentionality of everything that went into it. And then especially after ruminating on it and then seeing it a second time, it's like, oh, this is a good fucking movie. Yeah, I think I liked it more than you did at first. You did. This one just kind of instantly really found its way to my heart. It's so... I don't know. There's just so much going on. And it's so weird because I see, I've seen a lot of critique of this movie where people have said, oh, it's just kind of, you're a basic slasher. And I didn't really care about any of the characters. And I I feel like I watched a different movie than people who think that. Our our buddy and producer and co-host Zoran tweeted about it, saying that he didn't understand uh, the killers and their motivation, whereas I find them two of the most compelling antagonists yeah. in the horror movies in recent years. Yeah, yeah. It's, and we'll talk all about that. And I've seen that. a lot of people say that. Not not just Zorin. So yeah. I'm really putting <laughs> Sorry you to put you on blast, Zorin, buddy. <laughs> but the villains in this are really, uh, one, re- really empathetic in a way that makes you feel weird inside and makes you, I don't know, like the thing that motivates them, I think, is deep, like just deeply terrifying. Yeah. And two. And scary. T- two of <laughs> the easiest villains to kill or go up against. (laughs) Like if they were in our March Madness bracket, they would just get absolutely rinsed by everyone in the bracket. First voted out in Survivor. Like they're fucking dumb. Yeah, they're out. (laughs) Yeah, which also makes them really fascinating. I mean, they take themselves out. They're so frail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Their bodies just give out on them. Uh, You know, the easiest summary of what this movie is and I think kind of the log line of it is Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Boogie Nights. 
It is about, it takes place in 1979 in Texas. It's a group of people going to make a porn on a farmer's ranch. And then... Unbeknownst to the farmer and his wife. <laughs> yep. A very yeah. elderly farmer and wife. And then bloodshed ensues. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that is a simplified um, understanding of it. And if that's all you get out of it, I feel like you might be missing some themes. Because the theme throughout of age and sexuality is... That's like what really sets this apart for me. And yeah. also what made me... I, it like it, it deeply it just really scared me it's yeah it, it's existential this, yeah this is very existential horror for a slasher which it is kind of a slasher structure i'd say it's yeah a slasher. it's so it just this is an elevated just made me slasher. think about stuff i try not to think about <laughs> yeah and we always i think on this show especially we always talk about how horror is so great because it really like horror movies dive in to stuff that we are all universally afraid of and that's why horror as a genre is so cool because there's something really unifying in everyone just at a primal level, we're all scared of certain things. Like most people are, are afraid of the dark or like dying strangers. or yeah, or someone breaking invasion. into your home. Like that's mm -hmm. pretty universal. And so is this theme of we're all going to fucking die someday and we're all going to get old. Yeah. Even before we're all going to die, we're all going to get old to a point unless you die young. Lucky. Yeah. You're yeah. The, the luckiest best among outcome, us. The, yeah. The best outcome of life as a human is you get <laughs> so old that you can't do what you want to do it's i don't know it's just huh. and the sense that you get old to the point where people ignore you and you yes. can't function and you're not desirable anymore and these are all themes that are in this movie and portrayed in such a sympathetic way ty west does such a good job it feels like he like spent a night with his brain transported into an elderly person and felt those things and was able to come back and be like, no, guys, listen, this sucks. This would be a nightmare double feature with the amusement park. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh my, I don't think you can recover George from that Romero's night. George Romero's The Amusement Park, which is another devastating meditation on aging. And he was commissioned to make that film. <laughs> yeah. And when he's, I think when he screened it for, I forget who commissioned it, it was like a religious group. I think. Yeah. And, and they like, were like, this is so bleak. Dude. Why'd you do this? Yeah. Cause that's also about, it's, it's this metaphorical amusement park where. It, it, it follows this old man as he is too old to be, ride rides and everyone kind of ignores him. And it's, oh, it's, it's like that one's shot like an experimental it's a, film. It's it a is nightmare. a nightmare. We <laughs> yeah. saw that in theaters. I, and it's only like 60 minutes feels long. Feels bad, man. Yeah. It, oh my God. That was like being wrapped up in a weighted blanket and just being unable to escape that feeling. Yeah. And this one is a bit more fun, but I, we were talking about how, you know, we were rewatching this. And we rewatched Fresh for the previous podcast. And like, I was less excited to rewatch X just because of these heavy themes. But rewatching it, as heavy and depressing as it can be, it's still just so damn good. Yeah, there's enough fun to keep this from being miserable, which yeah. I need. This isn't a dirge of a movie. No, this, this is... isn't so bleak that you're just like morose the whole I mean, time. The, the credit song is a needle drop of Simply Irresistible by Robert Palmer. So <laughs> great it's, needle it's drops, great. yeah. Like the mood of this is so weird and fun. And I, I, just, I just love it. There's it's enough so humor throughout. And the other really cool thing is all the characters, not just the compelling antagonists, the protagonists are some of the best slasher characters I've seen too. Because, yeah. you know, a big uh, complaint towards slashers that both of us have is a lot of the times the characters are just whatever. They're there to be killed. These characters are very sympathetic. They're good people all around, I'd say. Flawed in yeah. various ways. You get, it, it's weird as much as when I think back on it, I don't think, there's not a ton of dialogue explaining who each of these people are, but you kind of get a sense of what kind of person each of them is and maybe just a general, very vague idea. Like the one guy's a Vietnam vet yeah. and... Maybe the other, the two younger ones who are filming, like Jenna Ortega and her boyfriend, or maybe they met in school. I don't know. Yeah, it's I think fine. they're college students. Yeah. But he you... says from the university. Oh, so. they do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they do get enough. You get enough time spent with them that you really care about them. And they're all really well rounded. Compared to something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where they feel like real people, but just like very blank real people. 
Yeah, and like the, the OG Texas Chainsaw. The OG Texas Chainsaw. I think the most you get is Sally and Franklin, maybe. Franklin for sure is a character, and Sally also. But the others are just like, you can probably, you can, probably can't even teens, name them all. Yeah. yeah. Like, they're character names. They're just like there to be uh, mirrors for our terror that we can experience. Yeah. Uh, whereas these people are like, Really, like I was saying, sympathetic. A lot of times slasher victims, it's like, oh, they had it coming. And even in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we always joke that it's Leatherface defending himself from a home invasion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just sure. walk in. But these characters are going out of their way to be good people, friendly, helpful people to the uh, the antagonists. Yeah. And they still get killed. This, I, I think a lot of this movie is the send up of the idea that, oh, if you have sex in a horror movie, you're going to die, which I mean, is the case for most of the characters in the movie. But the movie itself is not punishing them for that. Like the authorial voice of the movie is not saying, yeah, they all had it coming because they're all whores. Yeah, <laughs> it's literally much. the characters within the movie being like, this, I'm going to kill you. This honestly, if if you maybe haven't seen this and you're concerned that, oh boy, it's like a horror movie where it's a slasher and it's about making a porn, is this going to be maybe mean towards sex workers? Is this going to no. be a mean movie concerning sexuality, especially where women... No, this is honestly one of the most sex positive horror movies I've ever seen. And it is booby. There's yeah. tons of bo but that's part of the but story it, and it's really part of the theme. Yeah, and it never feels exploitative. No. And I think maybe part of that is the characters themselves, which I love the, the porn crew in this. It really mm -hmm. feels like they're all making this porn together, especially the lead actress in the porn, Brittany Snow. Brittany who is Snow. Just, I'm obsessed with her. Though. She's so good. But I think her just being such a driving force behind getting this porn made and the fact that they all really believe in it is just, it's really nice. And that's the other thing, the whole fucking cast is amazing. Yeah. Everyone. I mean, Maya Goth. Is it Mia or Maya? I think it's... I always read it as Mia. Maybe Mia Goth. Uh, who's the guy from The Ring? Who's in here? Oh, uh, uh, uh... Because he's like the Martin ring Henderson. Lead. Yeah, Yeah, fantastic. the boyfriend from The Ring who mm -hmm. gets killed by Savara at 20 the years end. later, he's, he's the uh, EP of a porn film. Uh, he's so funny. And he also was in Bride and Prejudice, which is a very fun send up of Pride and Prejudice that is Bollywood style. Oh, okay. That's cool. That was a good 2000s rom-com. <laughs> yeah. Britney Snow, like you mentioned, from Pitch Perfect. Yeah. Is that right? And okay. Hairspray. Jenna Ortega, who is, of course, We all know. Darling. Yeah. I was like, we all know Jenna Ortega. I don't really know Owen Campbell, who played RJ, but he's great. Yeah. See, seeing this in a theater in LA with, <laughs> as we learned later, a lot of the people who worked on this, because that just, that, that happens in LA, you'll sometimes go see a movie and people will clap really loud during the credits at someone. You're like, you're oh, like, oh shit. okay, they're there. <laughs> uh, that guy got such big laughs because he's such a film nerd stand in. Yeah. It was so painful. I mean, if you look at his character in this movie and then Google image search Ty West, <laughs> you can look tell. a little similar. He looks yeah. like Ty West does in Your Next. And then Kid Cudi. So good. So good. Yeah. I had, I just assumed, I didn't know that was him. And I just assumed, oh, this is some kind of random actor who's been in a lot of really good indie shit. And mm -hmm. he's, a, and no, no it's, it's Kid Cudi. He's so good. Very he's, good. He, him and Brittany Snow in this are such warm characters. And I love them. I don't know where I was going to go with that. All <laughs> I can think of is them. just, I really love them. They just seem really nice. And I, I like them. And I was, I'm sad when they're. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler. <laughs> it's a slasher you guys yeah. come on so at this point i would say if you haven't seen it pause this go watch it go watch it you can see it on bod it's kind of expensive it's like a 20 dollars rental it's not but oh, you know get some people together yeah it won't be weird to all watch in a group depending on the people there's not as much sex in this as you would think oh um, yes there is is there there's like three there are two Pretty long. Pretty long. Scenes. Not explicit. You don't see like P and V or anything. But like, there's a lot of... YouTube would fucking shut it down because there's a lot of gyrating. They don't oh, like the gyrating. The implied, the motion. The motion, yeah. That's just so any weird. of this, you can't even have... Even if it's just like a dude doing this. No. Would this get us flagged? Just like... Oh, this? Come at us, YouTube. Please don't. Also, anyone, uh, whoever's editing this, don't include... You're just going to have to really move around the footage. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, Josh. So, now that you've paused it and you've seen the movie and you're back, 
Welcome back. Uh, we'll just go through the movie, right? Yeah. Uh, this this first shot first is shot. I'm instantly in love, right? Yeah. Like it's because the first shot is through a set of barn doors and what it, the barn doors are frames so that it perfectly creates the four three aspect ratio. And at first I thought that it was the aspect ratio, but then you start moving through it the doors through. and you, I realized it was a pair of doors and I just lost it. A it's little so bit. good because really there's good. a lot of you know we're seeing the footage that they're filming here. And that is 4 3. It's footage. 4 3, yeah. So it's a great fake out of like, oh, this period film is going to be. Oh, no, it's not. It's so good. Uh, there's so much attention to detail in this that just. Uh, I, I want to. Shit, I meant to look up who did all the set deck on this because this movie is like over the top, amazing set decoration and design. Yeah, difficult to do that with a period piece, but this really feels hard. very good, uh, an emulation of 1979. Yeah, uh, it opens, as we would know because we were totally Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it opens after the fact with the police force investigating the police. crime scene. It's three guys. Yeah, yeah it's the sheriff and it's his two lieutenants. It's three guys and one of them talks like John C. Riley. <laughs> look, what I, look what the boys found in the barn. I love him and I wanted more of him. That's my, that's my one criticism. More of that guy. Starting after the fact is kind of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. It, yeah. That starts after the fact. And you know what? There's no real need to do this, but whatever. It's, it's kind of fun. It's worth it because it sets off the line at the end. Yes. Which is, this. a lot of movies, it would be a little too cute I for me. I thought that you might not like it. I like it. I think okay. this earns it. Yeah. There, there are some, I'd say at least three lines in this movie that are like, just they're, pushing. they're like basically meta they're basically winking at the camera including the very last line when the lieutenant finds a video camera and he's like what do you think's on it sheriff yeah and the sheriff's like well look judge my all this one goddamn fucked up horror picture yeah smash X. cut to yeah. robert palmer music <laughs> yeah it's good it it push it's it's just teetering on the edge of too much for me but i it's fine i think it earns it then we cut Back, I think it says what, like twenty four hours. Twenty four hours later, later or so. earlier, not later. They're at a strip club. I think. I think. Uh, what's his face? Wayne. Yes, Martin Henderson's character, Wayne. Sounds like he owns. Seems like he owns the strip club and is uh, uh, expanding his uh, foray into filmmaking, adult filmmaking. Because Debbie Does Dallas just came out the year prior, oh, okay. and they're like, if we can do half the numbers that that movie did, we'll yeah, be set. That's something we should talk about too. Is just like. Porn. Porn in the 70s made box office money. Deep Throat, let me look up. Deep Throat was earlier. Early 70s, yeah. Debbie Does Dallas, 70s. Because this is before the home video market. Yes. So. Seven, Deep Throat was 72. Uh, yeah. It made, I mean, it was one of the top movies the year it came out. It's what the RJ especially is talking about in this, where I think it was a bit more like, we can make these more like actual movies. It is possible to make a good dirty movie, he says, which I count um, again among the more meta lines. Sure. Like, it is possible to make a bloody booby slasher and have it be really good, which right, is what Ty exactly. West does here. One of my favorite uh like professor's assistants in college. Did you ever have Peter Al no, Lunas? Shout out to Peter Al Lunas from the University of Michigan. Gressler, did you ever have Peter no. Michigan? Gressler's helping us. He's cutting this live. We're doing a whole thing. This is the first time we're doing a live cut. Live cut. Yeah, this is, we're experimenting. Uh, so hopefully we didn't fuck anything up. So Peter was our, our uh, my TA in a few different classes and he was working on his, I, I forget if it was his master's or even like his doctorate. Like he was writing his thesis on specifically the switch from porn being exhibited into theaters to the home video market and how that completely changed the industry. So he was like a porn expert. <laughs> like that, I, dude, I loved that guy. He was so fucking cool. That's why Boogie Nights is so good because it documents mm -hmm. the the journey of porn as it jumps ahead through all the, the years and decades. So they leave this strip club, which is in the middle of like yeah. a refinery area, it's a very in like industrial oil area. Re yeah. I forget who says it, if she says it to herself or if Wayne says it to her, but you're special. There ain't nobody else like you. He I says think that he to says her. it to her, right. And that is going to be a recurring thing. There's lots of mirrored them. dialogue in this. Yes. And it's fun. It's really rewarding to watch a second time because I noticed so much more of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, they're in this strip club, which is in, I mean, I guess that's, strip clubs are... In weird spots like that, like this by the place, airport in, or in city skylines. What's the game? 
city skylines. The noise pollution and actual pollution would be off the charts. But this place is red. smack dab in the middle of one of those the yellow industrial zones. zones. Yeah, yeah the yellow. And, and then there's like one block of what red? The commercial district. Yeah, just yeah. one block of <laughs> for sure. that's this building. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the building is called the Bayou Burlesque mm -hmm. uh, Strip Club, and there's a gator mural on the side of it, and Britney Snow. And she, it's she, the gator's biting at a woman's bathing suit. It's like a, suit. It's like a copper ad. tone ad. And Britney Snow is the first one to open the door and walk out, and it looks like the gator's eating her. That is the first of many fun foreshadowing of the characters' deaths in this movie. There's so much thoughtful foreshadowing and writing. Again, watching this two times, so rewarding. Yeah, because uh, let's just go through them now because like, we don't have to like say them as they come Yeah, up. so there's that. There's um, Wayne saying, they're talking about the porn they're making, and Wayne goes, oh man, people's eyes are going to pop out of their heads, and he gets his eyes. Stabbed in the eyes with a pitchfork. pitchfork. Kid Cudi talks about his time serving in Vietnam, and he says, I've had enough farmers shooting at me for a lifetime. Gets shot in the chest by the farmer. Yeah. And then were those the only ones I we noticed? I think those are the only three we caught. We couldn't figure out what RJ's or Lorraine's were, if they are alluded to at all. They probably are. They probably so are, and we just missed it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just fun little stuff like that. It, like, this is a movie where you can tell they went back many times in the script and made sure to add little things. And we also think uh, this film was shot alongside secretly a prequel yeah. called Pearl about the elderly antagonist when she was young, taking place in 1918. When we saw this movie in theaters, we were lucky enough to see the trailer, already edited together by Ty West, play after the credits. That trailer I don't think is online. It didn't play I, after the VOD. I couldn't find it anywhere. I Googled it on, uh, or I searched for it on YouTube, and I could only find reaction videos the to it without only the trailer. The other time I was able to watch it besides seeing it in the theater was someone's cell phone recording of it. They put on Twitter, and like, no way does that exist anymore. So I think that they went back and added some things to this movie after filming Pearl, or at least when they wrote Pearl, because there's a line in here that yes. you noted. Yeah, yeah. Pearl tells her husband, you, you know, know I, I don't, don't like blondes. blondes. And it just feels very specific. And I wonder if that's going to come come up in Pearl. And then when they're driving in, uh, you can hear on the radio, the radio is talking about a 60-year anniversary of something. This takes place in 1979, which we get with the awesome oh, American. The, the fucking Easy Rider style, yeah. red, white, and blue, stars and stripes font. Yes, oh, that's so great. Good. And so it's saying there's a 60-year anniversary of what? We don't know. We don't hear. But since Pearl takes place 61 years prior, maybe we'll find out. Maybe there will be like a one year Yeah, time I have jump. a feeling that's a tie in to that story. Yeah, I'm interested. This soundtrack rips, by the way. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, because this is right in the here. summertime when the weather gets hot. I love that fucking song. It's a good combination of songs you're really familiar with, some you're maybe not so, and then also I think some original or at least covers by, like, I know one of the um, co composers or the people who did the music chelsea wolf mm -hmm. the song that plays when she's doing the headlight yeah. dance was sung by chelsea wolf i saw in the credits oh, so i don't know if that's an original song or not breaking news or rather just something i didn't realize until after we were done recording this episode the song we oui, we oui, marie is actually from 1918 it's an old wartime song world war one song yet another detail that i think is super cool because 1918 is the year that Pearl is going to take place. Okay, back to the episode. They are. They're in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre van. Yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, it's framed exactly like the movie. That's the that's the weird thing about this movie is it feels the comparison to Texas Chainsaw is so obvious and I think really intentional. It looks the most like Texas Chainsaw. It looks more like Texas Chainsaw than any of its sequels. Yes. <laughs> and, and I think it is kind of a an intentional homage, but it's about totally different things. I think visually yeah mm -hmm. it's definitely all one kind of giant reference but besides that no but yeah. there is like they start off in a van then they go to a gas station and then there's the farmhouse and just all visually the farmhouse looks similar and then there's a shot of wayne like looking into the screen door that looks like it's it's an framed exact yeah where he's kind of Texas backlit Chainsaw. and only they don't like we said they don't enter the house uninvited yeah like yeah, they do yeah. in texas chainsaw mask dude kirk walks right in and <laughs> then immediately gets hit in the head with a hammer <laughs> he's trespassing he's trespassing actually that's that kind of makes me think of the line near the end where 
uh, Howard is like, oh, help me drag her inside. If she was in the house, it, it was self-defense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's like, to help me make it look like Texas Chainsaw Master. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which would have come out, but which is weird to think about. That's how old Texas Chainsaw Massacre is. They it would have been out for a... five years by the time this movie yeah, took place. Yeah, everyone on their YouTube channel would be like, this is old. <laughs> this is an old <laughs> movie. <laughs> In the van, they're all talking their American dream, which, mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of this movie is extremely American. <laughs> it's the most like, a, I mean, the red, white, and blue font, as if that's not a big giveaway for what we're kind of dealing with here. But I love Brittany Snow's line about like, I just want a pool that can put my knees up and tan these titties. <laughs> yep. She has some of the best dialogue in this and She's she sells so it too. There's there's another version of this where an, a different actress maybe oversells this character and makes her too goofy. But Brittany Snow manages to make her still pretty over the top, but also really real. Like I can imagine this woman being a real person. And I just kept thinking, I. She's the type of older lady that I love and would want to hang out with where she's like in her 70s and is extremely leathery <laughs> and still smokes and, and has a really much. like a smoker's voice and is bleach blonde. Bleach blonde, yeah. It has crazy stories it's from like, the 70s. It's like the, uh, the friend in There's Something About Mary. Yeah. Right? That That's the visual I'm getting as you describe her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like even the mom in Strictly Barroom is a little bit of that lady too. Yeah. Not as many people know that movie, but. I would say that when Maya Goth gets to talking about her, you know, American dream in the store with Wayne, there's a little bit of clunky exposition because she's just like, I need to be famous, Wayne. I want the I whole world to, to know famous. my name. Like Linda Carter or some shit. Yeah. It, so it's it's very much spelling it out. Like, I need to be famous, but yeah, sure. it's fine. It's whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting is in this scene, she says something about how she doesn't like being stared at. And she, she talks says about how times, she yeah. says it a few times. She's like, the people here stare and I don't like it. Yes. they. So, yeah, here's our group. We got uh, Wayne. Wayne Martin is Martin Henderson. He is the executive producer financing this adult film. Yeah. He has grabbed a university... A uh, film student named RJ to shoot the movie for him. He's RJ is 23, he says later. And RJ is, like Chelsea was saying earlier, he's the most film student stand-in. It was so painful. He means well, but yes, he is definitely a... Because he just, <laughs> he's, he's so relatable because if you have ever tried to get into film, especially as like an early 20s kid... You get hired for, you know, you take projects to make money. And Mm -hmm. because you so badly want to be making something that matters, sometimes you end up really overselling to yourself what the thing you're working on is. I've done that before. Do you know know what I'm talking about? That feeling of like, I need to believe this is something bigger or else I'm going to go crazy. Yeah. And he's talking about editing, like playing around with the editing to make it avant-garde like they do in France. And yeah, he's... He wants to make cinema. really good porn. Really, yes, cinema. He wants to Cinematic make elevated porn. porn. Yes. And that is like an illegit movement in porn. Literally, when I was looking at the Deep Throat Wikipedia, it says uh, Deep Throat earned mainstream attention and launched the porno chic trend. Ooh. With RJ is his girlfriend Lorraine, played by Jenna Ortega, fellow college film college student, we can surmise, because yeah. it looks like she helps out with all his films. She's boom hopping. She is uh, so quiet that they call her Church Mouse. Church Mouse. She says that she didn't know that this was what she was signing up for when she said she would help RJ film. Dude, because I bet he was like, oh, we're, it's like a small, like independent thing. She you know, it's like it new wave porn. shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she is very uh, timid in this film, which is a fun role for Jenna Ortega to play. She usually is a much. A very outspoken character. Yeah. And of course, this character does become that. A yeah, more, yeah. But it's nice for her to start off with that. We have the stars of the film, uh, Brittany Snow as Bobby Lynn. And she is, yeah, it sounds like she's the main dancer at the, the strip club. And She's is, been in a few, por- She, I mean, she's acted in porn before. Yep. Because what was it, the topless car wash was their last movie? <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know if that was a movie or just literally a topless car wash. I'm not sure. Oh, I thought that I was did- that. Well, because she was like, you said, because he, I think Wayne is talking about the script and is like, this is it. This is what's going to you know, really bring us more, you know, mainstream attention. And she goes, you said that about the topless car I could see that going either way. Dude, it could be a movie or he could have sold them like, yeah. Is it a movie or did they actually have a topless car? An artsy that, that topless That Wayne sold topless them as like, this will put us on the map. <laughs> 
The other actor, the male actor in the porno, played by Kid Cudi, yeah, is Jackson. Jackson, whose name doesn't get said until I think 50 minutes into the movie. Yeah. Even the subtitles were like man one man. for a while. But Jackson is there and- Oh my God, it could have been Bobby Lynn's partner like in the Texas <laughs> yeah. Chainsaw movie. There's fun dialogue between Bobby Lynn and Lorraine when- uh, she says, do you always help with your boyfriend's film? And Lorraine says, sometimes. And then she's like, oh, is that your boyfriend? And Bobby Lynn's like, sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. So they have a real cute relationship. And I, then there is Maya Goff as the person who needs to be a star, Maxine. And yeah, Maxine she's meets. kind of with, she's with Wayne. She's with Wayne. Yeah, they're partners. And I think she's also a dancer at this club. Yes due to her snorting coke in the dressing room. I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe she just hangs out in there. I think she's a dancer. She's definitely a dancer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would make sense considering the parallels with her and Pearl that she would also be a dancer. Yes. Um, I like to this scene is the first time we hear the phrase X factor. That's something we hear uttered a lot. And I like that you look like the title is X and you think, okay, that's a reference to an X rating which definitely I think is, that is what it's referencing, but also the idea of an X factor, mm -hmm. which that's something that's so uniquely American. Hollywood and film. You think of the, like the it girl mm -hmm. is, weirdly I learned most about the concept of the it girl in my silent cinema class because there were it girls going all the way back to silent film. Oh, wow. there, there, like ever since the dawn of film, there's always been the idea of the it girl and then that it girl is eventually replaced by yeah. the next big thing, the next girl with the X factor. I like this scene where one, you have Brittany Snow making a, a good suggestion to RJ as he's <laughs> filming a little scene at the gas station when she's like, if you film it from this angle, it'll look like he's using his cock because he's filling up the tank. And then RJ does it and it's like, yeah, that's a good Especially shot. Especially because that was after RJ was all like, okay, I'm doing all kinds of stuff with, you know, editing. And it's going to be like, what, that's when he says, it's what like what they're doing in France. Yeah. And then of course, just the porn veteran walks over and is like, just frame it like this and it looks like his, his dick and yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And then she's talking to Wayne about this film project and she's like, yeah, the script's okay, but I love that he has this line, I don't want to have to wear a hard hat to make a living. Mm -hmm. These people really want to be stars. They don't want to have to like do menial work. They don't want to live lives that they think they don't deserve, which is a through line throughout this movie. Mm -hmm. And another, like the idea of, it's not my fault that you didn't get to live the life that you wanted is said later to Pearl. And it's because these people are still young and are still trying to achieve their American dream life, which does not involve wearing a hard hat for a living. So right. that's a theme throughout of these, just like Maya Goth continually saying like, I'm a star. And then also keep in mind too, this movie set in the seventies, which the seventies economically is not great. 79, yeah. So that also I think adds some layers to him being like no i need this to work mm -hmm. i can't do anything else because i think people are starting to feel really desperate and i think that's also why the choice to set this in the 70s makes a lot of sense because that's also a theme in texas chainsaw massacre too it's the like collapse of the traditional american way of making a living and i feel like often movies that are made in the 70s or about the 70s feel there's something apocalyptic about them and I you get a sense of that here too I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the through lines is there's a evangelical preacher on the tv definitely lends to the feeling of end of days kind of shit yeah yeah Hey, I want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, Shudder. Our friends at Shudder have the best streaming collection of horror films anywhere, period. They've truly got such a wide range of stuff, really feeling the vampire stuff they've got on there right now. They actually just added Aaliyah's Queen of the Damned, All the Moons, which is a vampire epic about a young orphan girl given the cursed gift of immortality. They actually just added a bunch of full moon stuff too. We just did the movie Subspecies for our Patreon commentary track this month. I had such a fun time with that one that I might, might want to do all the subspecies sequels for Patreon. We'll see. And hey, if you're listening to this episode and you've never seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which we're talking about a lot this week, they have Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well. So go check that out. Obviously, it's my favorite. 
With Shudder, you can stream thrillers, horror, and suspense for $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. So if you want to check out Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use the promo code DEADMEAT. That's Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com. Use the promo code DEADMEAT to try Shudder free for 30 days. Shudder.com, promo code DEADMEAT. Our next sponsor this week is Fume. So in this movie this week, if you're watching it, versus listening. You might notice that a lot of characters smoking cigarettes. Everyone smoked, it seems like, in the 70s. So if you're seeing clips in the movie this week and thinking, man, I actually really want to quit smoking, Fume is here to help you out. I know so many people who've tried to quit smoking and it seems so, so difficult. I've seen every method under the sun. I know someone who resorted to chewing tobacco for a while. It's rough. It's not fun. Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and and more natural way to quit cigarettes. It's a no smoke, no vape, and no nicotine replacement for the hand to mouth habit of smoking. Fume is made of 100% Canadian maple and uses cores infused with plant oils studied to curb cravings. So they have flavors like peppermint and what they call conquer that has minty notes that's designed to simulate menthol cigarettes and other flavors too, like lemon berry bliss for a sweeter experience. So whether you're a smoker or ex smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is the perfect tool for you. It's time to create positive habits and quit naturally with Fume and we're here to make it easier. Right now, if you head to breathefume.com slash deadmeat and use promo code deadmeat, you are going to save 10% off your entire order. That's 10% off your entire order when you go to b-r-e-a-t-h-e-f-u-m.com slash deadmeat and use the code deadmeat. Our last sponsor this week is Hawthorne. I have James here to help me with that read. Yeah, because I'm a man. Yeah, uh, we we did one take of this, and James yelled that so loud. It, I'm a man! Yeah, no. Nope. <laughs> 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 Hawthorne is men's grooming and skincare, and they actually even have a little quiz on their website to help you determine what works best for you. It's an there. extensive quiz. Well, what was it like? It asks you about your skin type, your hair type, how often you shower, which was interesting oh, okay. to me, how often you apply deodorant, all sorts of things. And then at the end, it uh, gave me some recommendations of products uh, along with what they would be doing. So I was recommended some some deodorants that wouldn't stain because I often wind up with little deodorant marks on my mm -hmm, clothes mm -hmm. and those aren't good. And then it gave me cologne that would make me smell memorable. Cause no one really? wants, yeah, no one wants to smell forgetful. What kind of what kind of scent smells memorable? I saw sandalwood in there, and I I'm do a big like fan sandalwood. of sandalwood. Yeah, sandalwood's very nice. And I like that their products seem to be very specific and tailored to individuals. So you know, it's not a one size fits all type thing. If your skin is more oily or if it's more dry, it'll give you a different product depending on it. All the different hair types. It, it's nice because I feel like a lot of generic men's care stuff is just uh, just do it because it's manly. And this one is more like, no, you are an individual with individual needs. Well, if you want to find out your individual Hawthorne needs, <laughs> you can take their quiz. Go to hawthorne.co and use the promo code DEADMEAT to get 10% off your first purchase. That's Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot C-O, promo code DEADMEAT. Hawthorne.co, promo code DEADMEAT. Take their quiz, find out what fits you, and get 10% off when you use our code DEADMEAT. Be so they get to the farmhouse and meet the owner, Howard. Played, yes. Played by Stephen Err, who is 64 years old and is playing at least 10 years older, if not 15 or 20, uh, as Howard. Prosthetic work. What else is he in? I, I don't know. Was he, he also have... in, like, random Lord of the Rings? Is he a oh. Peter Jackson uh, alum? He was in Return of the King. Let's see. He's Gorbag in one of the Lord of the Rings. In another Lord... Of, oh, in Return of the King, he's Gorbag. But in Two Towers, he's Grishnok. Oh, dang. And then in The Hobbit, he's Thimble slash... Uh, I can't see the name. Grin... Grin something. Oh, he's in Deathgasm. That's right. He's the rock star in Deathgasm. Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which is a fine movie. He comes out with a shotgun because <laughs> yeah. he, he doesn't trust Martin Henderson, thinks he's someone from the county. Martin Henderson's like, no, we talked. We're just... I'm renting your Airbnb. Yeah, I'm renting your guest house. Yeah. He's like, oh, that's all right. I don't keep it loaded. Martin Henderson's like, yeah, dude, I have the same in the glove box, which we saw Maya Goth reaching for a handgun in the glove box, but turns out 
unloaded just yeah. as uh, Howard says his shotgun is. I was going to say, but it's not. But that one is I think loaded. he just said that he to just save some it. face. Yep. Howard goes to show them the guest house, but before he does, Maya Goth, Maxine, sees through the window Pearl. Pearl. Howard's elderly wife in the upstairs window. And I thought it was interesting, watching this a second time, I noticed that Maxine is shot through the open van doors window. window, And she's looking up at Pearl through the window. And all the shots and the reverse shots of each other looking at each other are through windows, which is interesting because those characters are like looking at windows of themselves, windows into the future and windows into the past. Mm -hmm. Because something I I am a little ashamed to admit I didn't know until the credits rolled. I didn't realize this either until the credits. Pearl was played by Maya Goth in heavy prosthetic makeup. I thought it was maybe someone in makeup, but I didn't think once that it was her. Which... (laughs) <laughs> is an amazing choice given the themes. It's so it I I got what they were going for and I was really affected by it, but then realizing they were the same person was like, oh man, it just hit me like a truck. Literally the same person. Yeah. In that the same actress plays them and there's there's so much dialogue between the two of them of like I was young once I was special once this will happen this, to you you'll, you'll be me someday which is terrifying and true mm-hmm. and just yeah the the mirroring of dialogue between them and their partners with each other yeah. and just their scenes together it's it makes it there's, so heavy there's a lot of yeah windows like you mentioned there's mirrors lots of yeah lots of that imagery because mm-hmm. there's another very specific window scene later with the barn where Pearl is kind of spying on her. That's yeah. also through a really dusty looking window. And I have seen people say that they hated the prosthetics, the aging prosthetics. They never bothered me. No, it doesn't bother me. A lot of the time it's it in shadows and darkness. I guess when it's like really well lit, I'm thinking of when RJ's going to leave and the headlights go on. The headlights are the one scene I I can think of where I maybe see, yeah, you can tell maybe it's makeup, but... The rest is kept in shadows enough for it to be effective for me, even if I'm watching and knowing that these people aren't 70-something years old. Yeah. It works for me. So, Howard takes them to the, uh, the guest house, and even here, even as early as this, Howard stops to cough and... Wayne is like, you all right there, old timer? Like, these young people are concerned about the health and well-being of their older (laughs) caretakers. Even after... Like, they they think they're kind of weird and... Yeah. I mean, obviously, showing up at the front door with a shotgun is going to put me on edge, but... But even after that, he's, like, friendly enough. And, uh, you know, Howard begins to piece together with the group of people there and the film equipment that something's not right. I laughed really uh, hard at the line of like, I don't think I like you, Wayne. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's like, I don't like any of you. Uh, So stay away from my wife. Yeah. Speaking of little things that I caught, both of us kind of laughed at on the second viewing, um, which is why, again, this is so fucking cool to watch twice is when he, Howard's showing them the place. He kind of is looking at Maxine Mm -hmm. and Wayne is like, oh, you know, stop, <laughs> stop ogling my uh, my girlfriend. Uh, it's been must must have been a while since you've seen anything this nice. And in retrospect, knowing that they are played by the same actress, like that is what Pearl would have looked like. Mm-hmm. And and it's been a it's while. It's such a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And then uh, when Howard leaves, and Wayne is talking to his crew, and they're like, you didn't tell him we're shooting porno. He says no, but he kind of justifies. Howard's uh, anger towards them. He's like, well, his his pecker ain't been hard since before you were born. I would hate us too. Again, it's that theme of like these old people who are are now infirm and have aged out of being sexual beings, or at least society says that they have, are angry and jealous at the people who have their youth and are still desirable. Yeah, like resentment. Yeah, of just knowing that that can't be you anymore, that you'll never be... You'll never be desired like that. Yeah. it's it's Again, it's Ty West. I don't know how he does it, but just capturing that, that sense of lost youth and how depressing that is. I think a big part of what really makes that work in this movie is the fact that it is set in the 70s because the whole time I'm very aware that the characters in this that are the young characters would be older now. I'm doing the math in my head the whole time. I think, what did we we decide? How old would, uh, like, Mia Goth? If Mia Goth were 25 here, she would be, like, 
in her in her sixties. Yeah, so like not mid to late sixties. They're not, not like super. They're old, not like but Pearl and Wayne Howard. Would. Old. Wayne would be. Yeah, in his Wayne would be later seventies. Yeah, um, or dead because he says he's forty three here. So yeah, yeah, he's he's he'll be in his mid or to late eighties. Yeah, right. I can't do math. Yeah, you're just so aware that these people would have aged. Yeah, since. like they they were young then. Yeah, and now they are not. Right, and that happens to all of us. Yeah, and and Pearl and Howard will tell you that sucks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now they film a porn. They film porn. And it's the, what was it called? The It's like the farmer's daughter or something. The farmer's daughters. Oh, daughter. Yeah, that's right. both daughters. <laughs> it's, I mean, there's, there ends up being three daughters. Ends up being three daughters. Uh-oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just like a very funny, again, this is, I love this scene because as much as it is like, you know, they're they're filming a porn and we're watching them film a porn and it's, it's titties. pretty explicit sex, <laughs> but it's also very funny and feels very sincere. Like there's a moment where Jackson tells RJ to like basically stop backseat fucking because RJ is <laughs> directing and is like, now tilt your chin back a little bit. He's like, all right, stay in your lane, dude. And um, Brittany Snow starts laughing. And then when she realizes the camera's back on her, she starts moaning again. Like she just goes, it just... I don't know. There's something very playful about this scene that I think is really good. And the th- it got a lot of laughs when we saw it in the theater. So. And it's preceded by another one of those meta lines where Wayne's like, all right, finally, let's give the people what they want. Cut to Ooh, topless Britney Snow. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, while they're filming the scene, Maya Goff and her side boob go for a swim. Oh my gosh, she's just wearing overalls with nothing under yeah, them. Yeah, this movie stars Maya Goff, Maya Goff, and Maya Goff's side boob. Yeah. Those are the top three. A lot of side boob. Yeah. Mia Goff, I'm sorry if I keep saying that. I think it it's wrong. Mia Goff. I apologize. Yeah. My bad. That's going to be all the comments. Well, no, because now I've headed them off. That's what you got to do. So, <laughs> fuck off. So, yeah, she goes for a walk looking like. I don't know, Tom Sawyer or something with these <laughs> Tom overalls. Tom Sawyer had titties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Th- this is, I can't believe they shot this in New Zealand because this whole area to me feels, I mean, it feels like they went to the original Texas Chainsaw location. Mm-hmm. It's so hazy and buzzy. Like, you can just feel like there's bugs everywhere. Yeah, and lots it, of, uh, like a, what is it, cicadas? Yeah, it's just, it's Constant just like, thrum. it's just oppressive summer feelings. Mm-hmm. Like, the original Texas Chainsaw is just so oppressively middle of summer. This feels the exact same way. And there's even this like swamp that she goes for a dip in, which fuck that. Skinny dips in while Pearl is stalking her from behind. Yes. Like from the woods. I love this shot because it's Mia Goth on the, the dock and then Pearl is in the background and she kind of creeps out of the trees and they have this lighting, this like diffused lighting coming through Pearl's hair. So you almost see like just this halo around her head. So she's just barely visible, but you see this kind of white blob of her hair and it's really creepy. Mia Goth swims in the swamp. A gator gator. wakes up and like great overhead shot of her swimming and then the gator starting to catch up. This was so fun in the theater. Everyone was about to shit their pants. It was so tense. It's ultimately... I don't want to say inconsequential because we need to know that there's a gator it's in the swamp. It's Chekhov's gator. Yeah, Chekhov's gator. But it's just a good little suspense scene of her like swimming and the gator catching up until she gets to the dock. And then there's another transition joke with, I think, uh, Wayne saying like, and now let's call action or something. And she gets out of the water and mm-hmm. her butt's there. But Mia Goth goes and uh, sees Pearl at the farmhouse and they wave to each other in like a very mirrored way, very mm-hmm. hesit- uh, hesitant waves. And then yeah. she goes into the farmhouse and has a little bit of lemonade. Yeah, I, I love too, there's this moment where when it's the two of them looking at each other, there's this really suspenseful kind of thrumming music and it fades so perfectly into the porn music of yeah. the movie because the rest of the scene is cutting back and forth between the porn they're making and Mia Goth getting lemonade in this farmhouse with Pearl. Very awkward uh, lemonade date. She just drinks all like, gotta go. she chugs that thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And this is when Pearl starts to like say that uh, I was young once too is a line and she shows her a picture from around 1918 yeah, where Pearl will she, take place. She tells, uh, Maxine is Mia Goth's name. Mm-hmm. She t- it's weird saying like, it's Mia Goth because they're the, the same they're characters. Both Mia but, Goth, yeah. Um, but she tells her, you know, I was a dancer and I was you know, really beautiful, like beauty's powerful. Like Howard, my husband would have done anything for me. He Um, served in both world wars. Yeah. Oh my God. That sucks. That was like the worst year to have been born. If that was a possibility, (laughs) fuck. And she says that she was a dancer (laughs) until World War One disrupted that. And she says, not everything in life turns out how you'd expect, which is another theme throughout this of just 
these youths trying to live that life that they want to yeah. live. Yeah, there's something because the first time I this didn't because uh, I mean there's there's a lot going on um, in the movie, but the second time it kind of stood out to me more the fact that this scene is intercut with the porn and the fact that it starts with both scenes are lemonade. It's Pearl offering me a goth lemonade, and then also in the porn, it's Britney Snow in a sundress. It, but this movie's just basically, it's getting railed in a sundress summer. <laughs> Britney Snow is in her sundress, and she offers uh, Jackson lemonade, and the vibe is completely different, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but I think there's something so interesting about the way it cuts back and forth story-wise, because Britney Snow is like, oh, you know, quick before my daddy gets home, and this all is happening while Howard is out. Howard went off to do something, run yeah, an errand. in town or something. Yeah. And so Pearl, I think, is using this opportunity to have uh, Mia Goth come in and is offering her lemonade. And, and is trying to seduce she her. She is trying. Yeah, she, we went, she goes and touches her. And it's in this weird, bizarro porn scene, or at least that's what she wants it to be. Yeah, because as we learn later... Uh, you know, obviously, spoiler alert, Jenna Ortega finds a sex slave being kept in the basement of this elderly couple because Howard has heart conditions and can't have sex with Pearl. Yeah, so apparently so she's extremely horny. She is. That's her motivation for murder is horniness. And yeah, she honestly, there's there's a lot of horny horror villains. She's up there. She's got to be the horny. She might be the horny. I don't think anyone else that's kills. Her just because they're horny. Yeah. Yeah, she might be the horniest horror villain of all time. Yeah. Wow. Hats we, off to Pearl. <laughs> we find out that, yeah, they are apparently kidnapping young people and using them as uh, sexual gratification for Pearl. The one down there is a, a man, but it turns out that I guess Pearl goes both ways yeah. because... Howard's trying to kidnap Jenna Ortega for her, mm -hmm. but she wants Mia Goth. Yeah, because she, she says she has such a special face. Yep, she, again. And she has Maxine look in the mirror, so they're both looking in a mirror, and they're both in the mirror next to each other, and it's just so much of that visual. <laughs> and that, that dialogue is also reflected in the porn that they're shooting when it's Mia Goth's scene. And she's in the the barn, and Kid Cudi comes across her, and is like, "Oh, your sister never mentioned you." And Mia Goth's uh, Maxine's porn dialogue is, "Well, she's always been jealous of me. I'm younger, and I get all the attention, mm -hmm. and uh, she never leaves the house anymore." It's basically her describing Pearl yeah. now and Pearl's attitudes towards Maxine. Yeah. Yep, exactly. I love it. So yeah, Pearl goes and like touches her side because again, yeah. she's just wearing overalls with nothing underneath and she goes, it'll be our little secret. And, and Maxine has a, what will? Dude, <laughs> so her reaction funny. is so fucking good. Like, yeah. what? like what are you talking about? <laughs> again, it's like, Pearl, I think, is unknowingly or not trying to make a porn for herself. She mm -hmm. wants to be the star of a porn, and yeah. it doesn't work out so great for her. So Maxine goes back and shoots her porn scene. Yeah. Uh, there is a shot that we didn't mention. I just got to say, there is jizz in this movie. That yes. is like on uh, Britney Snow's thigh and she wipes it off and uh, throws the towel. It's yeah. real gross. She like, I think she almost hits Jen Ortega does. with it. She's, She's like, like, oh, oh sorry. sorry, church mouse. Maxine films her porn scene with Jackson. Yeah. And, and after she is found by Wayne and he tells her we're losing light. And I'm like, that's honestly a problem. Yeah. That's not good. You can't... Especially for a low budget little Dude, indie porn like you this. You better get in that barn and start fucking. We're losing daylight. <laughs> While she's fucking, Pearl creeps through the window and sees her. And then Maxine like turns around. And I think it's just a stylistic thing. She doesn't actually see Pearl there. No. But there's cuts between Mia Goth as Pearl. Maxine and then her as Pearl in the same position. Yeah. Just really driving home. These are, the, are the same, same character, person. just older. I mean, not literally. Not literally. But, but in thematically. essence and thematically, they're the same person. Yeah. Which is great. Um, There's a, uh, a porn debriefing after this. Uh huh. Where uh, Jenna Ortega asks, Isn't it weird that you, are to you two are together and you two are together, but. You all fuck each other on fucking. camera. And that's when Wayne explains, well, I mean, it's different when the camera's on. And he kind of explains those boundaries. By the way, I love that their meal, their dinner is white bread sandwiches and beer. Oh, God. It's so bad. Also interesting, the scene that I noted is that Jackson and Bobby Lynn are sitting together real close. And so are Maxine and Wayne. But 
RJ and Jenna Ortega. They're in totally different spots. They're, in They're not seats. touching. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, this is the scene I was talking about earlier where Mia Goth is, uh, she catches Jenna Ortega staring at her and gets all pissed, like, you know, stop staring at me. It's rude to stare. And I, I think her kind of fixation with that is like, I think it plays into the same insecurities that Pearl has that you, I know that I think Mia Goth's character has, and that's kind of the curse of being young and beautiful is knowing that it's all gonna go away someday, even if you deny it, right? Cause I think that's why at the very beginning she's snorting coke and hyping herself up like you're a star, you know, you're a sex symbol, mm -hmm. because I think deep down she knows it's all gonna go away someday. And I think the idea of not liking people staring at her is knowing they have to eventually not be staring at you. And I think it's maybe her realizing that that attention's gonna go away. Well, I think this whole scene is really the this is the, of the best movie. scene in the movie. This this is this the is, movie encapsulated. This scene is so good, and I don't even care if some of the dialogue is very like explaining what the movie's about. I don't care. It's very good. Which it is. They're talking about what it's like shooting porn and why it's okay for them to have sex with each other, and they're saying because one day we're gonna be too old to fuck. Literally the thesis. Of the <laughs> yeah, thing. that's the that is. If you could <laughs> distill it to a sentence, it's one day we're gonna be too old to fuck. Yeah. And, and that's scary. And so might as well have fun now. They toast to being young and having fun until the day they are. <laughs> and then the day they RJ die. adds to the power of independent cinema. <laughs> during during this scene, when they're talking to Jenna Ortega about like monogamy and, and the, the whole having sex with each other for a, uh, a job, Maxine mentions, take it from me. Uh, don't be held back by outdated traditions. Right. And there's this through line throughout the movie of a televangelist. He's on screen in the, uh, the gas, gas station. station. He's all over Pearl and Howard's house. He's always playing in their house. It's like they're just tuned to that station. Yeah. And at the end, we see that he reveals, this is my daughter who yeah. was lost to sin and it's Maxine. So she comes from a family of of like evangelicals evangelicals yeah. and it even turns out that the the line her little ma mantra that she repeats to herself of i will not accept a life i don't deserve came from her dad who leads his his parish in saying those words mm -hmm. so i find that really interesting and they did film pearl as a prequel to this but a24 already greenlit this as a trilogy of films they uh, there will be a sequel to X if everything goes right and so i'm assuming we'll see more of Maxine and perhaps her home life because... i think that's what's going to be especially the very last not the last line of the movie but the last thing we hear from the televangelist is like we all hope that she comes home to us one day and it just mm -hmm. feels very specific so we'll see what happens to Maxine's future after seeing what happens in Pearl's past. And I think it's fucking cool that A24, like this is their first franchise, I think. Yeah. Uh, but that they had so much confidence in Ty West that they were like, go ahead and film this other movie before we even see how X does. Fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, this also is uh, the scene when they're talking about the difference between, you know, just straight up like cheating on someone and like, we're you know, th the boundaries of what it's like dating someone who's in porn. Mm -hmm. um, and RJ says to Lorraine, like, it, yeah, it, it's just a movie. And Lorraine's like, no, yeah, I know, I know that. And it's this, I think that is the exact moment she decides I want to be in a porn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he is a little condescending there. He is. He's such an interesting character because he is like the saddest man in this movie. Like yes. he, it's, he has such a, he has the most bummer time out of any person For in this sure. movie. He just um, wants to make a movie. He, he He's just a wants film to make who wants cinema. to make cinema. And then he goes there after not being entirely on the up and up with his girlfriend about what it's going to be. And then she's standing there booming the sex scenes and there are push-ins on her face being like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there's a, a little and, musical moment that we'll talk about in a bit. But as soon as that ends, she's like, I want to be I in the I want to be in the porn. Yeah, there's a lot of moments where looking back... It, there's, there's a build to her just finally oh, yeah. saying, fuck it, I want to be in this movie. And it's just everyone's silent, and he's like, what? 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 Yeah, and, and that's after, so she makes that decision after the most amazing <laughs> musical scene. In like, this this scene is, uh like, I was truly stunned by it. Mm -hmm. I think it just, this it's so easy for this to not work. 
Because what happens is Kid Cudi grabs a guitar and he starts playing Landslide yeah. by Fleetwood Mac. Which I don't is, know if he's actually playing it because we never I get shots of his is, hands. But so. Britney Snow is singing. I mean, she, she can is sing. singing, yeah. And so she sings Landslide and it's this like montage where it's a split screen and the split screen kind of moves back and forth which is cool between them and pearl all alone in her room at like her vanity mirror taking off makeup that she had put on earlier and oh yeah because we didn't talk about that it's it, she gets herself made up and yeah. approaches her husband yeah and she wants to have sex and he said we've talked yeah, about that's this. right before this okay yeah so let's rewind a little bit because that's really important that's the first scene i wrote it down where there's like a somberness to the score where it's yeah. not needle drop or like scary music. It's sad, it's sad music. sad, yeah. Because she gets she, herself She starts up. dancing for Howard and he's like, I can't, like my heart will we've, give out. We've talked about this. My heart can't take it. And he just leaves the room. Yeah. And she looks so rejected. Yeah. And it's so sad. And, and then, that's when we have the scene of all them talking and, you know, somebody are going to be too old to fuck. Yeah. And then... We get landslide, and so it's the, yeah, back and forth between them and Pearl's taking off the makeup she'd put on for Howard, and it's fucking devastating. Like, it really took my breath away the first time. Like, when we saw it, I was like, I wonder how other people are going to feel about this, because I could see maybe, I don't know, because landslide is a strong choice, because that's an overused song. Mm -hmm. That's a song where if someone starts doing it at karaoke night, you're like, all right, I'm going to go to the bathroom (laughs) real quick, you know? It just... But it works so well here. Well, it's because the lyrics fit so much yeah. into the theme. They're, I'm getting older too, afraid of change. The child within my heart, like Pearl feels younger than she is. Yeah. It's And yeah, all the while <laughs> they're singing the this. The editing is so good and like. <sighs> her taking off the makeup because she got rejected. It is, it's real sad. And it's the scene, I think, the whole movie hangs on. It's the scene that makes Pearl a sympathetic character despite what she, and, and gives her the motivation and you gives you the understanding of why she does what she does. Yeah. Like, God, it's fucking devastating. Yeah, that's why I'm like, I don't understand there being confusion about the motivation of the killers because this scene out. is pretty... One day we'll be too old to fuck. Yeah. That is the motivation of the killers. Yeah, and just realize, especially when you... Um, I, I think I've, I've said this to you before. I think a really interesting maybe documentary would be about women who were famous because they were attractive and what that does to you, especially as you age and how like, even when you are young and attractive, being aware of that fact and understanding like this is not gonna be forever and just psychologically how hard that must be. I think of like a Megan Fox who is still a fucking like knockout. And that's why so many people hate her too. Is mm-hmm. She's just so hot and it makes you hate her, right? <laughs> and that's a big part of what makes this scene hit so hard too, is the younger people all know this. And that's just, oh, it's sad and weird. The second landslide ends is when Jenna Ortega's like, I want to be in the movie. Yeah. And uh, RJ, her saying this and then doing it and RJ having to film it sucks so much for <laughs> Dude, RJ. it sucks. It's the saddest shit. It is the most traumatizing shit. He, he does not respond to it in the best way. Because uh, like you said, he never says, I you're... don't want you to because you're my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Instead, he says, no, you can't. It's my movie. Yeah, he just goes, no. Yeah. You can't and, do that. And which, you know, even though they just had this conversation with the other four who are all cool with it, those are people who are all in agreement about it. Whereas you have, you have to have your partner in agreement of it. Yeah, but that's what I that's why I pointed out. Like I don't know if he ever calls her his girlfriend. I I don't know if he does, but they clearly are. Yeah, but I but think it's interesting that in all of his reasoning, yeah, yes, he never once says no because you're my girlfriend and mm-hmm. I, that's not what our relationship is. It's no because it's my movie. And then later he's talking to Wayne and he's like, look, Lorraine's not like the other girls in there. She's a nice girl. The, the fact that that's that his argument. Is, yeah, I think what, I think it's really intentional versus like, no, I don't want to watch my girlfriend have sex with someone. It's Which like, is what is definitely the true case. Yeah, for and sure. you probably just can't find those words. But like the fact that the, the argument he falls back on is, well, no, she's a nice girl. Yeah. Not like them does make it interesting. Yeah. And that also, I think, 
plays into his, oh, I'm not making a porn, I'm making cinema. He thinks that he's better than like whatever this is and wants to like be above it somehow. And this might be a peek into the fact that he, he doesn't truly believe that because right. if he was making cinema, would it be okay for his girlfriend to be in it? Well, no, if you're just making a porn at the end of the day, you probably don't want her to be in it. Right. Uh, and I feel like later she's like, I feel bad if I hurt him. I don't want to break up. Well, Lorraine, you're going to break yeah, up probably. You fucked it. Uh, but your early 20s, it's, it's not it's great, fine. but you'll live. Yeah. Wayne talking to RJ about how Lorraine wants to do this. Another line that plays into the theme, Wayne is like, you ain't been 42 and I have been 23. Just another sense of like age and I have been 23. I was young once and I'm not anymore. I'm 42 now. Yeah. No, real life, he's 47. Looks great. Yeah. When he comes out in his underwear, get that guy, Martin Henderson. Good job. He was dude. on Grey's Anatomy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's uh, the yeah, so we start seeing Jenna Ortega get ready to shoot a porn, and it's weird. And, and I'm glad yeah, we don't see any of it. When we when we saw the trailers for this movie, and it was <laughs> like, they're shooting a porn, Jenna Ortega's in it, and she says something about wanting I to be wanted, in it. No! We're like, she's she's 18 or 19. She needs it's to be legal, protected. But, uh, she does not get naked in the movie. In fact, because of her character, it's funny. They like go to film it. Her, she does not have matching bra and underwear. Yeah. Her underwear is very wide white panties that say Sunday, Sunday. on them, like the day. Mm -hmm. She is not those prepared are, to Those were in very movie. in style back then. I think they had a resurgence in the 2000s too. I had day of the week underwear. I had day of the week boxers. Did briefly, you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the Tuesday ones fell apart fast. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. She takes off her uh, Jesus necklace. She does, <laughs> yeah, before they film it. Yeah. I wrote here that um, something I kind of took away from this too, like RJ and... Um, um, I don't know, just the idea of him being okay with shooting a porn and him totally understanding, like, yeah, they have this relationship where it's fine that they shoot porn and blah, blah, blah. I think his whole thing is the discomfort of realizing that women are sexual in ways you don't approve of. Like, women are people. And then maybe the discomfort that often comes with realizing, like, oh, women aren't just sexual beings when they are being sexual for my enjoyment. Mm. They are sexual they outside sexual of that, right? Wants, yeah. Oh, these are beings outside of them making a porn for my viewing pleasure. Mm. They have their own thoughts and uh, turn-ons and desires and kinks and whatever. <laughs> this poor man. This poor guy. He has a shower <laughs> he just cry. Is crying in the shower. Which, like, some people like. It's funny on some level, but it's also really sad. It's it, it's it's both. It's funny and sad. The, I think the way it's shot is a little funny, just because it's very over the top. But like, this is when everything falls apart. Yeah. Because he's like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna leave." They can find their own way out of here, and he tries to take off in the van. Yeah, now's when everyone just is gonna get murdered. Yeah. One by one. Uh, because um, Pearl's there in the headlights. And he yeah, gets, he tries to drive away. Pearl's there. Don't fear the Reaper's playing. It's yep, great. Yeah, He tries to talk to her, and she tries to kiss him. Ew, yeah, and she's kind of feeling him up and stuff. And he just goes, why did you do that? Yeah, and it's so funny. I was telling you that the first time we saw it, I could have sworn that he said something about, like, ew, or, like, that's disgusting. He doesn't. He, he seems concerned. I he's think, concerned. I think he has the thought, like, oh, she's not, not all right. There. Yeah, and yeah. he even says, let's go find let's go your find husband. Let's go find your husband. The first of all these characters trying to help these They're all people good out. characters. They it's, are. It's what makes this really a fun movie and a good slasher is I give a shit about all of them. And as soon as he rejects her sexually, She's, she fucking stabs dude, him in the throat. It's so bad. And, and then this is one of the, this is the gnarliest kill of the movie. I think this is the, the grossest kill for she sure. She gets him on the ground, mounts him, and then stabs away at his neck Dude, so many it times. it turns into hamburger. It, it's it, so Yeah, he's decapitated gross. by the yeah. end. His head is separate. Yeah. And it's splashing on the headlights, bathing her in red. Yeah, this, this, it, they, they might as well just put red gels on the car headlights. Yeah. And then she does her, she's dancing she in the headlights. She feels young again, enough and, to dance. It's fucking and this, wild. That's when the score changes to that song. Um, and it's really beautiful and fucked up. Cause she's dancing kind of in the same pose as the picture we saw on the wall, and and this is when the uh, slow burn finally, finally, you know, yeah, erupts. It's a slasher now. Yeah, T Ty West, uh, he's made jokes before about how all his movies have just been described as slow burns, and they are, and so is X. 
And this is when it pays off. Wayne goes to look for RJ because Lorraine is concerned. concerned. And <laughs> so then Wayne's looking in the barn. I love that he goes, I ain't getting in the middle of no more. There's shit and wags his finger. Great delivery. It's very good delivery. He goes to look in the barn where they were shooting earlier. He steps, steps on a on nail. nail. Eh, bleeds all out the foot. And then he sees like, like, I don't know. He must see something outside the door. I don't know why well, no, he, he just sees the three holes in the wall and like goes to look out. Oh, it. it's not a door. It's just the wall. I think it's the wall of the barn and they're pitchfork holes. I don't know if there's a practical purpose for them or <laughs> yeah, if they yeah. were put there for this purpose, but he looks through the holes and then gets stabbed in the eye with a pitchfork from the other side. Yeah. Eyes popping out of your skull, it's like we confusing, said earlier. It's confusing. I think just because this one's the most like, huh? Out yeah. of all of them, so this would probably be my dull machete. Just because I'm like, what's... Even though there's a close-up of pitchforks going into a guy's it's eye. It's pretty gross, but also it's into like, why head. are there those holes there? Yeah, it's a little It's convoluted. a little... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Pearl comes around. <laughs> she's like kind she's of just poking. Very, very, the, the weakest double tap I've ever seen. Just, eh. And then covers him in some hay. All the while, Jenna Ortega wound up in the house with Howard. And he's like, oh, go in the cellar. There's another light down there. And he locks her in the cellar. And then. That's when she finds. That's when Jenna Ortega sees a naked guy strung up from yeah. the ceiling. Well, I and- think he's dead. Yeah, okay. he's very dead. Okay. That's why I was like, this basement would smell really bad. Mm-hmm. But she gives an amazing scream that is the poster for this movie. Yes, it is. Yeah. Or at least the splash screen for the uh, rental that we did online. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then Howard winds up at the house again. Well, everyone else is sleeping and they're waking up yeah, this is the middle to of the go night, die. Yeah. So they're all is, getting woken up to get killed. Here. That's yeah. what's so weird is like the two killers in this. Like I said, they're the easiest to defeat killers ever. They're like both physically very weak. Pearl definitely is stronger than Howard. And we know that even just by the fact that he's like, no, my heart, heart will literally give out if I exert any effort. So I, I think it's pretty consistent in terms of that. Like, they're never doing anything too crazy. I think it's just because they catch them so off guard, they're mm-hmm. able to kill them. Yeah. It works for me. It's the element of surprise. It's yeah. And it, 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 I was never like, oh, I can't buy into these yeah, old people yeah. killing them. So Jackson wakes up now and Howard's like, oh, my my wife's missing. Can you help me look for her? And Jackson is, first of all, totally naked. You just see his dick like hanging between his legs. It's comically large. Yeah. It's like a got to be a prosthetic. Yeah. Because who knows? It's probably prosthetic. Yeah, I think it's a big, it's, big. It's that's, very, yeah. very big. <laughs> and so then he's He's like, all right, let me go put my skivvies on. And then he tells him, you know, like once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, they were inter- both military guys. What's interesting is that Howard doesn't ask for help. That's right. Jackson yeah, offers Jackson offers. Help. Howard's like, my wife is missing. And Jackson's like, well, let me, uh, I'll help you find her. Uh, what well, he says, not for self, but for country, right? He says, once some a help. Marine, yeah. Yeah. And so he, he gets uh, underwear on and goes to it. <laughs> the scene's just... It hurts. Jackson's really sweet. Like I loved even like even more so this time around. I was like, Jackson just seems like a really nice guy. He's going so out of he's his like, way. He's like, if you he goes, if your wife's out there, I'll find her. He's like, yeah, they're at a, the swamp, and he's like, I spent three nights in Vietnam, like looking for booby traps. If your wife's out here, I'll find her. Yeah, like I'll I'll go out in the swamp and find her. Yeah, for you. in his underwear to help find this old lady, and he's so sweet. And then. <sighs> he, 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 before he gets killed, he does find a car in the swamp, very reminiscent of Psycho, which is mentioned in earlier dialogue. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Psycho. Uh, I feel like Psycho is referenced a few times. Even like finding a body in the basement and the scream mm-hmm. reminds me of finding the mother. In and the I basement. believe the car in the swamp is be- yeah. belongs to that pearl uh, in the guy. window. Oh yeah, feels yeah. very Norman Bates. To but me. yeah, the the car I believe is belonged to the guy who they found in the basement, right? And who may have been on the milk carton? I think maybe it was him on the milk. It was, like it was hard to person. tell. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so after Jackson sees there's a car in the swamp, he then, he goes and looks for Howard. He sees Howard is, like, in, I can't, again, rewatching this, it was really dark, and I couldn't remember yeah. exactly what was happening here. But Basically, they wind up on the dock, and Howard's got his gun, and is talking about, like, you can still do what you please. Again. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what it's like. You can still please a woman. You're just, you're just like the last guy who was here walking around enticing. The last bohemian The last bohemian who was here walking around enticing my wife. And that's when Jackson, it's the fast line del- delivery, goes, yeah, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> and then Howard shoots Jackson. Just shoots and him. Sad. And it's like an off-screen shot, too. It sucks. Just it like, makes me sad. It's very sad. He just I'm glad was really show. nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now the dudes are all dead. It's down to the ladies yeah. with Lorraine trapped in that cellar. She gets a hammer and tries to bust her way out. With no, the... she grabs an axe. Oh, is it a little hatchet for a shining thing? That we Kelsey... do a shining reference. 
Guys, we need to retire it. It's been, I feel like every other movie I watch now has the exact where it's like tracking the axe. It's a cool shot. I get why we all want to do it. We can't, we don't have to anymore. I, we should do a super cut on it. We right. should. It's done so yeah. much. Uh, uh, yeah, but she, like she's trying to unlock the door and she just gets her hand bashed in with yeah. the butt of the gun. So she's just fucking stuck in that cellar. Bobby, what's her name? Bobby, Bobby Lynn. Lynn. She wakes up. Yeah. She sees Pearl like walking out from the, because Pearl was in, I think that's when Pearl uh, snuck in in bed with uh, Mia Goth this whole yes. time. So Pearl this whole time while Howard's looking for Pearl, Pearl's actually in the little like house they're staying in. And she sneaks into bed with Mia Goth and it's just like feeling her up and getting blood all over her. Yeah, it's real gross. And um, so when Bobby Lynn wakes up, she's woken up by Mia Goth screaming because mm -hmm. she realizes that Pearl's in the bed with her. And then Bobby Lynn sees Pearl leaving. Uh, finds her naked. Out she by finds the her naked swamp. by the swamp, like on the dock. And Pearl or Bobby is instantly like, "Oh my gosh!" She went, she goes and covers her up, and she's like, "Okay, let's get you back inside." You know, my nana gets confused sometimes too. I read all about it. I want like she just is being so Again, sweet. So sweet. She's like such a just nice. Wants to be helpful. I just love her. And then Pearl slaps her and <laughs> is like, "What have you ever done except be a whore?" And then Bobby Lynn just goes. Okay, you know what? <laughs> it's so good. But then uh, Pearl pushes, pushes her, her into, into the, the swamp. swamp and says, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then the gator gets the her. The gator gets Chekhov's her. Chekhov's gator emerges. Chekhov's gator, and yeah. bites Bobby Lynn's head off. Yeah. That's when I think Howard finds Pearl and now they're talking about like, oh, hey, I got Jenna Ortega down in the basement for you. And she's like, no, I want Mia Goth. She had something special. And I'm sick and tired of never getting what I want, which is a line that Maxine said in the gas station yeah. at the start of the movie. Again, They have characters. a lot of shared lines. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so then they go back to the farmhouse to look for Mia Goth. And instead, they fuck. They fuck. Yep. There's old people sex with and, Mia Goth under the bed. Yeah, hiding under the bed. This seems and, interesting because my first. Sorry, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say the dialogue that precedes it is is really sweet of Pearl saying like, "Tell me I'm special. Tell me." Uh, he says that she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, and she says, "Well, not anymore." And then I love. You. Always. Always. And then they So fuck. sweet. And then they fuck and uh, she's uh, make me feel young again. Yeah. It's and, interesting because I, I think this scene is maybe made to make you second guess your instant revulsion to yes. these people fucking. Exactly. Because at first you're like, oh no. And it's the overhead shot and his ass is seen as he's it's pumping away explicit. at her. It's very explicit. And it's like. And this old lady saying, fuck me, Howard. Yeah. Fuck me, Howard. And yeah, your initial reaction is be like, ew. <laughs> and then it's like, but why? But that's the movie. That's, the, yeah, that's the, the, what it's saying is like, yeah. they want to fuck too. Yeah. And if this were a scene, w were you laughing earlier when it was Bobby Lynn and Jackson fucking? No, yeah. you were probably kind Kind of titillated <laughs> yeah uh, and if you were laughing it wasn't in the same like ew, ew gross, gross way so it's like why is it just because they're old we're all gonna be old we're all probably yeah, still gonna want to fuck when we're old think of how it feels knowing that one day maybe you'll be the person where someone's like ew gross yeah if you reveal that you still have sexual desires it's so uh, uh, I think, yeah playing off the audience reaction is yeah it, it knows how it's gonna make you feel yeah. it's very good yeah maxine realizes that the van tire's been popped because she finds rj too she goes and grabs the gun from the car not realizing that it's not loaded mm -hmm. um, she frees jenna ortega yeah who immediately goes this is all your fault i hate all of you and lorraine goes no we have to stick together and i think it's <laughs> like it, Jenna Ortega, as much as she wanted to be in a porn, she doesn't want to be a porn star. She no. doesn't want to be. She still thinks of herself as she's, separate Yeah, she from thinks these of herself people. as being better than them, mm -hmm. and that instantly gets her killed. Yep, she runs out and gets shot. She gets it's a great blown sudden away. death. Yeah. Then Howard goes and drags uh, Jenna Ortega inside, He's has taken. a heart attack. Oh, yeah. He just keels over. Well, the, before that happens, he's like, well, oh no, I, I killed the one I was saving for you. And Pearl's like, Oh, we don't need her anymore. Now we have each other again. Yeah. Which is sweet. And then he has a heart attack dragging her body inside to frame it as self-defense. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when Mia Goth walks out with the gun and is like- Where does that give him the heart attack? Like pointing the gun? No, it was okay. it was him dragging. And then that's when she sees her opening to walk over and be like, give me the keys to the to your car. Yeah. And- So now, you know, Howard's had his heart attack. He's, he's dead. <laughs> it's down to Maxine and Pearl. Yeah. I love Pearl being like, he's having a heart attack. And she's like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> yeah. 
And so they're having this showdown, this confrontation, all the while the televangelist is playing in the other room very loudly because Howard turned it up to drown out Jennifer Ortega talking. Yeah. And so there's all this back and forth, and it's when you hear uh, the televangelist say the same thing that Maxine says of, I will not accept a life I don't deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found interesting on this walk th watch through is that Pearl tells Maxine, I know who you really are which is kind of three levels. The most surface level and the way that the character means it is, I saw you I having sex. I know you're sex. a slut. Yeah, I know you're a, a slut. Whore. You're a porn actress who I saw you through the window having sex. Uh, on a thematic level, I know who you really are is because you are me. We are the same person and you will grow up to be me. And then on another level is she's saying it while this televangelist is yelling about whatever yeah. he's yelling about. I know who you really are. It's that guy's daughter and you come from this background. Right. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. So Pearl grabs the shotgun that after after Maxine tries to shoot the gun it's and not it's empty. loaded. Yep. yep. And uh, <laughs> the, the gun that Howard claimed was not loaded is extremely loaded. <laughs> but she misses Mia Goth and instead the blowback just sends her flying out the front door. And out the front door basically breaks kills her. her. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. just laying there completely broken. And that's when Mia Goth walks out and like shushes her as Pearl is begging for help. She gets in the truck, starts it up. Uh, well, I said no, what she's what uh, Pearl is begging for help and Mia Goth is like does the shush that Pearl did to her yeah. earlier and then it's when Pearl realizes that she's not going to help her she goes from begging to help to being like you whore like yeah, you, you're going to end up just she goes you're not innocent you're not special mm, yeah saying you're not special yep. and I think she has something about like you're going to end up like you're me up it'll all like be me. taken from you yeah, I wrote down yeah. yeah and that's when Mia Goth gets in that truck and runs over her head twice and then says, it'll be our little secret, yep. again, mirroring and then the dialogue. She snorts coke off the dashboard and says something about divine intervention, another little nod that she's a preacher's daughter. Yeah. And, uh, cause that's on the TV also, which, well, and as a little punchline, the, the- After the shotgun blast knocks Pearl yeah. backwards, the televangelist is like, talk about divine it's, intervention. It's good, it's funny. it's funny, I liked it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I, I love too that she leaves in a truck because it reminds me of the ending of Texas Chainsaw Massacre where instead of Sally, being driven away, she's in the bed of a truck screaming. We have Mia Goth driving herself away, Coked up and zooted ready up to go. on coke <laughs> and ready to live her life, I guess. Um, yeah, and that's when we get the reveal that she's the preacher's daughter because the televangelist is like, "Look at this," and he unveils this portrait of my daughter, my Maxine. daughter Maxine. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then yeah, we briefly come back to the uh, 24 hours later with the cops and the must be one fucked up. Yeah, horror what happened picture. here? One fucked up horror picture. Oh, damn, I tried to slam this shut right as you said uh, that, like that. Well, we also uh, got this done before my phone died, so that's exciting. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, this movie fucking rules. This movie's great. I fucking love it. I will forever go to bat for this movie. One of my favorite slashers. Like, the more I think about it and just talking about it, for over an hour. I don't even know how long we've been talking about it for. Gressel? I don't want Hour 26. Hour okay. 26. Could we'll be worse. It down. Yeah. Could be worse. <laughs> uh, I love it. I think it's amazing. Yeah. I think it's so... Uh, thematically It's made rich. with a lot of love. And I think, I don't know, there's something about a horror movie that cares about its characters that just really, I don't know. It's yeah. Good. And like, I don't know, it is a slasher. But yeah, one that cares about every facet of it. All the mm -hmm. characters, all the dialogue, the foreshadowing, the filmmaking. The film looks incredible. I mean, it's a slasher, and because I I'm not a huge slasher fan, but at the same time, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite horror movie. So, like, how does that make sense? But Texas Chainsaw Massacre like, is that a slasher? Yeah, on one level, sure. On one level, yeah, but also there's so much more going on with that movie. Same with this, mm -hmm. and that's why I think also it's such a cool homage where it's like, yeah, slasher, but. There's a lot more happening. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, if you saw this and didn't see the big deal, hopefully after this conversation, you see a little bit more to it. Because it was, you know, like I said, when I finished it in the theater, as I was standing up, I was like, that was good. But then it's just the it more you good, think about it. It was good, not great. It was good, not great. <laughs> <laughs> but the more you think about it, and especially with a second watch after having thought about it, I just feel like it's it's got so much going for it that it's great. Yeah. I can't wait to see Pearl. Fuck yeah. That movie looks very That trailer bright. freaked me out. Yeah. There's creepy shit going on. And I'm excited for, to see something set in 1918. Yeah. You don't get a lot of horror movies set back then. Yeah. What's that going to be like? You, yeah, I don't know. And like 
it seems like the, her and Howard were already up to shenanigans back then. So oh yeah, and it'll be got a, Mia Goth as Pearl without like the makeup. There's like a character in a wheelchair, and in in the basement in the in X, you see a wheelchair down there, and I was wondering oh who could have been, or if it was. I was like, is this an homage to Franklin? What's up? Oh, but maybe, then in yeah. the trailer for Pearl. Pearl is behind someone in a wheelchair and is like about to push them off the oh, dock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cool shit. It's so good. Cool shit. Uh, next week is the American Psycho 2 kill count, so tune <laughs> in for that. <laughs> Please tune in for that. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. It's that movie be real is fun, yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Yep. And I'm at Carebeck, C R E B E C A R E B E C C on Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. We don't know what the next podcast will be, but... Nope. Uh, it's hard to do podcasts at the same time as hosting Kill Counts. It that's why out. you're only doing the two for now. Uh, but yeah, we'll I, have there's no way I could do a bunch. Like a run, like Soren did seven in a row. Ah, but man. he didn't have a podcast. Yeah, that's the thing, one. is yeah. it's hard to do both of these at mm-hmm. once. That's why we're doing a lot of reviews lately, because they're easiest to prep. But thankfully, between Fresh and X, they're both new movies that people wanted to hear about and that had... Great discussion. Yeah, yeah, there's so. some substance there. We'll do a really shitty movie next. Oh, yeah? Okay. I think I miss doing, like, just a real clunker. Talk about Veronica. N- I'm never watching that again. No. Never. You couldn't pay me to watch that again. <laughs> um, okay. All right. right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gressel, for doing Thank you, Gressel. This. Yeah, this is the first time we've had uh, just someone just chilling in the corner the whole time. I was worried it would fuck up our vibe, but it sure. didn't. I could just ignore him. And he's yeah, same with that. wearing shoes. Is like, is that gonna fuck up our vibe? <laughs> oh yeah, that's a real big it's concern okay. there. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, well, how do we? Do, uh, I'm James. I guess. Yeah, I, you're James. I'm James. It's really hot in here. Also, I'm sweaty. I'm like, I wanted to wear this jacket. By the way, this is the no, you're Chelsea. This is sweaty. the paranormal activity next of kin jacket. Thank you, Whitney, costume designer for that movie. And yes, many Whitney other Ann movies. Adams. Yep. Friend of the show. Uh, Until next time, I'm James. I am Chelsea, and this has been the Dead Meat Podcast.